Right, good afternoon everyone. I hope uh, you enjoyed your lunch and you enjoyed that. Thank you very much guys for that and for that incredible introduction to it as well, Fergus. Brilliant piece of work. And it's a very good lead-in to what we're going to discuss right now, which is the art of storytelling and the importance of curiosity in our world. And much like any, everybody else who's been talking here today, I'm delighted to be with an in-person audience once again. But for me, there's also a sense of relief because, you know, when you're talking into these screens, I was never quite sure if anybody was listening or if everybody was distracted by the latest cute cat video running in the background. And uh, <laughs> damn thing follows me everywhere. So today what we've got to do is we're going to talk a little bit about in this world of growing mistrust, and I distrust the AV team all of a sudden. In a growing world of mistrust and misinformation, how do we as the research community connect meaningfully with the public? And that's where the art of storytelling comes in and where it's so important. But equally, you know, there's an, this increasingly utilitarian world around research, where sometimes we're asked to value research just about what it gives us right now, the immediate. And there's a question about, well, what about curiosity-driven research, that early stage of it? You know, everybody's delighted when we have a vaccine after one year, you know, so that's, that's what science is about. But actually, what about the 20 years leading up to that of all the research and the importance behind that? And that's a harder story sometimes for us to tell. So that's what we want to talk about now. And we've got three extraordinary speakers coming in to talk about how do we combine some of these stories and how do we do better about making this communication work? And how do we make as well in a world where transdisciplinary research is becoming more and more of a topic? How do we make that work to our favor and bring it to the fore? And our three speakers, I'll introduce them all just now, they represent three different voices. We have the voice of arts and humanities and storytelling. We have the voice of STEM, but also that with a broader aspect beyond just pure STEM. And we have the voice of the public represented in our three speakers now. So the first person I want to introduce in the speakers is Maureen Kennelly. And Maureen is the director of the Arts Council of Ireland. Maureen, prior to leading the Arts Council, <coughs> the director of Poetry Ireland from 2013 until April 2020. And she was previously director of Kilkenny Arts Festival, artistic director of the Mermaid Arts Centre, general manager with Fishamble Theatre Company, and has also worked with the Druid Theatre Company, the Cats Laughs Comedy Festival, the Arts Council, and the Design and Crafts Council of Ireland, amongst many others. The other thing I've learned about Maureen is she is an incredibly accomplished and eloquent speaker. And I learned this to my horror some time ago when I shared a panel with her in Creative Brain Week, and she spoke first, and I realised I had to go second. Um, a mistake I won't make twice. So. Um, I'm very pleased to have Maureen with us today to talk about her experiences from the Arts Council. We then have Professor Ijoma Uchebu. Now, Ijoma does not need to be introduced because Philip introduced her earlier on this morning. And she's, you know, in terms of her academic prowess and the things she does, and obviously she spoke very well this morning about her, her research. But there's always a lot more to an individual than their research of what we see in one dimension. And I had a great conversation with Ijoma over, uh, over lunch, and she describes some of her passions about storytelling, about equity, about communicating science. She says she's a scientist, she says, with a side hustle in diversity and inclusion. So this side hustle is something we're going to talk about just now. And finally, Dr. Niall Smith, a man who needs no introduction, but who nevertheless wrote three pages of introduction and asked me to read it out. <laughs> I uh, jest, of course. Uh, it's, uh, Dr. Niall Smith, who's a PhD in astrophysics from UCD. He's currently head of research at Munster Technological University and founder director of the internationally award winning Black Rock Castle Observatory, which I believe is celebrating its 50th anniversary and over 1.2 million visitors. And Niall is here in particular because he was on the expert committee for the Creating Our Future campaign and very much represents that voice of the public. So, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to go and have a chat with three. Very good speakers who, having listened to them at lunchtime, I think all I have to do now is say go, and then I'll let them at it. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you very much, guys, for joining us. I look forward to having a conversation with all of you. And Maureen, I'd like to start with you, because something you said at lunch, and I've heard you say before as well, that we've talked about a few times, is this perspective about curiosity and research in the arts world. Uh, and in fact, you describe arts as experimentation and curiosity. Could you elaborate on that for us? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, before I start, thank you very much for the invitation to be here. I'm absolutely delighted and lovely to meet new people. And just to say to, to Fergus, I'm going to borrow that introduction to the film. The film is beautiful, but your introduction was absolutely extraordinary. That's, that's a poem in and of itself. So you'll, you'll hear me quoting that in the future, Kieran. Um, but yeah, for thinking about today and, and thinking about this fascinating topic, um, I often think about Yeats and he's saying that he made a poem out of a mouthful of air. 
or the Greek poet Sappho who said, mere air these words, but delicious to hear. So it's lovely to think of artists who create something out of nothing or who make what might not have happened happen. The, uh, our current fiction laureate is the novelist Colm Tobin. And he talked a few weeks ago about the beautiful music made by Moirid and Srina Nigonal, and he talked about the excitement of, of what might not have happened. Because I suppose artists are compelled to create, but if we didn't live in a country that valued them, they may not have that good environment in which to create. So in the way that ideas are brought forward through science, it's very similar in the arts. You know, it, it is that thing of an artist waking up every day and thinking, OK, I've got to be original. I've got to create something new here. And we think about storytelling in the arts across all the, the art forms, not just literature, where obviously stories are, are a very obvious thing to think about. And in thinking about stories, I was thinking about Enda Walsh, the playwright who used to be based in Cork, now based in London, who said, what are we if not our stories? So we are all walking around composed of these stories. And just something we said at lunchtime uh, reminded me of a, a story that Enda Walsh told about walking over one of those lovely small bridges in Cork City and being suddenly absolutely struck by the tiny, tiny place he had in the world, that he just suddenly had this moment of epiphany. And I guess that's the other thing that the arts can do so powerfully is to be transformative. So artists themselves are tr transforming nothing into something, but they're also then transforming their audiences. Like it's the connective tissue then, it's what happens to the audience. So watching that film is a fantastic example of, you know, feeling change, feeling the air very much inside you actually move and shift. And you talked about it being valued in Irish society. And this is something that maybe is a bit of a challenge. You know, it's curiosity driven arts, you know, it's, it's valued. We might struggle, we might have a more utilitarian value system in Ireland for, for research. So why is it valued? And it was interesting to hear as well, you know, the, the research funding that you've got coming through is actually increasing all the time. Um, why is that valued more than maybe curiosity driven research, do you think? I guess there's a very strong tradition in Ireland of valuing the arts and maybe literature above other art forms. Um, I think the pandemic has helped the arts to edge forward even more because there was certainly a sense that during COVID when obviously the, the lockdowns were particularly severe on the artistic community. So the feeling, the narrative amongst the public was very much you don't know what you've lost until it's gone, the Joni Mitchell song. So here we are deprived then of live performance and we're run, the Arts Council is running a campaign at the moment on radio, which hopefully people will have heard, um, which is very much about you had to be there. It's about the live experience. It's about that effect of congregation. It's that idea of communing together and, you know, after an event when you literally you feel time suspend and you feel changed, you feel impacted and you say to your fellow, attendees, you know, how did that make you feel? It's about the questions it throws up, which is, of course, back to the curiosity thing. It's, you know, how is this going to impact on me in my future life? It's like, it's, it's really quite an extraordinary thing. Um, there's a great phrase from, hopefully people like, here like the American writer Elizabeth Strout, who's, uh, there's a wonderful phrase in one of her books, tell me what it's like to be you. So isn't that essentially what we're trying to do is to explore and try to understand humanity better through the arts and I believe also through science. So Joma, if I pick up on that theme, right? So, and actually I love that line, tell me what it's like to be you because it's hard to, to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. But is that also something that's important to us in terms of you know, the scientific community, reaching out, having broader conversations with people, using storytelling as a way to break down those barriers a little bit and actually making it more accessible to a much broader audience? Yeah, I mean, storytelling is, is essential uh, to us as scientists. Um, in many ways, we have to communicate our research findings and we have to communicate those to our peers. And that we do extremely well. I think what we do less well is communicate our findings to members of the public. And the question is, why should we care uh, about what members of the public think about our research? Well, first of all, they are going to consume our research and also they're going to shift politicians in the direction of funding our research because we are constantly in competition with infrastructure funding. I understand there's a housing shortage in Ireland. We're in competition with house builders. We are in competition with schools and education. And we have to make the point 
that um, funding research, both basic research and applied research, is actually very, very important, not just to us as scientists, but to children, to grandmothers, and to parents, and also to people that have no scientific knowledge at all. And the one thing we also need to do is to make sure that the research questions we're asking are the right ones. Most scientists come from middle class backgrounds, and we do not know what working class people, people who don't have the luxury of a very good education, we do not want, know what they would really like us to ask questions about. And so making sure that we have scientists across a broad spectrum of socioeconomic backgrounds, across a broad spectrum of racial identities, and across a broad spectrum of uh, genders, for example, is very important. When you consider something like cancer, which one in two people are likely to get, there is more money spent on prostate cancer than ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is more deadly. And that's simply because the people that ask the research questions predominantly and at the top of the tree are male. And so we need to make sure we broaden out the scientific community. The only way we can do this is by exciting people to come in, supporting them when they're actually in the profession and making sure that people get to the top on the basis of their abilities and not because of their personal characteristics. Okay, so then that leads to a question and I'm gonna ask Niall, does the public care about research? <clears throat> so you were involved in creating our future. You have a very good insight. If they do, what do they care about? Yeah, so I think the, the phrase creating our future was I think inspired in the first instance because it, it, it kind of put that wrap around on the narrative is we want to know what you think the future should be like, not the question specifically what research should we do tomorrow. We want you to think beyond the tomorrow, but to think about what the future might be. And so what we saw was there was, for those of you who aren't so familiar, there were 18,062 valid submissions. When you take a country the size of Ireland, that's an astonishing, we had, we'd set a target of 10,000. And by the way, there was a fantastic team from SFI and a consultants company called Havas who worked in the background, brilliant to work with, a real privilege to work with. But we set a, a target was set of 10,000, there was almost double that. And we can see on, on the screen here, there was a, a bunch of categories that came through. But the key thing really was that we had submissions from 16 year olds right through to 90 something year olds. We had all of the 32 counties actually of the island submitted some uh, inputs into the Creating Our Future. And we had insights which were really interesting. And I was just thinking, you know, for example, on the housing crisis, one of the, one of the comments that came through was, why do we build houses that we then have to retrofit for people as they get older? Don't we know people get older? Why do we then have to change that? Why do we have houses that we have to retrofit for young kids? It was just that kind of, you know, a singular commentary, which you kind of think, okay, now that's an interesting one because you kind of think, well, it's all about energy efficiency or something like that. But maybe some of the other things, I've got an answer to, to that particular problem. And so the creating our future, what I think you can say, given the number, of responses, the breadth of responses, and the number of areas over which they, they cover. Irish people are definitely um, concerned about their future, have a voice about their future, and mostly think that researchers, or by in, inquiring, I wouldn't even necessarily call researchers, but by, by using the inquiring mind, that we're capable of, as a species, of being able to solve that. I think the one thing that came across as a weakness, and it was discussed a bit earlier on, is the interface between that and the political uh, implementation of that. I think it's understood why at times it's not always possible to do that, but there was a clear frustration, I think, amongst the public that some things needed to happen quicker, and I was really interested about the Campus Engage commentary earlier, Kate, and so on, about the, you know, why are we not doing some things more quickly than, than we are. Whether there are real barriers or not, I think that's something that is interesting, uh, nevertheless, as a result, which is that there is a belief we are able to solve these problems. There's a belief that we can solve the energy crisis. There's a belief that we can have equality, diversity, and inclusion in our society, that in a just transition, nobody will be left behind. There's a belief that that's all possible if we act together and, and implement it. So I, for me, that was very encouraging because there's not, not a sense of the future is in any way hopeless. The future is bright if we do things and if we work together collectively. And so I think that's a, a very optimistic 
national uh, viewpoint to have. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it was very encouraging to see that. Easier to say, and now we've got to get on to it. But I, I think the, the Irish public expect us to, 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 to try to, to do that. And just as a, a final point on that one, I mean, we, we've seen about the level of investment in research, and we all know that Ireland's percentage of investment in research has been lots of conversations for as long as I can remember about increasing that. I think the public would welcome that if, if there was a demonstrable way to show, from the Creating Our Future, a demonstrable way to show that that would likely address a lot of the issues that they have and, you know, respect their, in their belief that the system is capable if it has the scale and bandwidth to do so. I, I think also what this demonstrates, this um, particular piece of work, is that we underestimate the public's ability to understand the problem and offer ideas that could create solutions. And one thing that pandemic has taught us is that how quickly members of the public could understand the R number, could understand that the death rate and the infection rate and how they were interlinked. And people were following these statistics quite religiously, mostly because they wanted to get out of their house and go to the park and do something different than from watch Netflix. But they really did you know, engage with the issue. And we shouldn't talk down to members of the public. We should speak about our science in a way that's relatable, but we should also bear in mind that they really do want to understand what we're doing. I mean, I've, I've stood in street corners and it's very difficult to communicate without the jargon. But you know, you've got a, a child asking you, so what's the point? And you have to then begin to communicate the relevance. And I think that's something we don't do very well. And I think we could do a lot yeah. better. Of. It illustrates that people want this information. And I think as Maureen said, a good story is something that sucks you in. You don't, you don't think of it as looking from the outside at the story. You kind of get sucked into it. And I think we, we, we have a job of work to make people feel that they're also part. Maybe that's because they set the definition of the issue or, as, as was mentioned earlier, about, you know, well, that's not going to work because, obviously, it's too big. That, you know, that type of comment that might almost, on the, on the, on the surface, of be dismissed, but actually is fundamental mm. to the, the engagement of the public, who then are fundamental, of course, to what they say, parents and so on, and teachers, to the next generation who are then fundamental to creating our future. So it's a virtuous circle and, uh, it, and, and it isn't trivial. And that's one other thing that comes out, I think, of this is public communication of science isn't trivial. And we have to stop imagining you just stand at a tree corner, as you say, and you can say whatever it is and it'll be nat naturally happen. It, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a skill in itself that we need to nurture, I think, especially as we move into this more engaged and the public, pol public, or the, the public policy domain interface. And I love one of the things that flashed up there was like creating multiple possible futures. And I think, you know, hats off to you for the, the huge response. It's brilliant, you know. But I think the language that you use was very, very open. And I'm sure this is something you all reflect on a lot. Like research can sound dry, you know, can sound the, the very term itself. It's something that we battle with all the time ourselves. People think, oh, the arts, well, that's a bit off-putting, you know. And even the other day, somebody said to me about Culture Night, which I suppose is the kind of friendlier, more accessible end of the the arts. Somebody said, oh, maybe you should re like rename it to fun night. You know, maybe culture night is a bit forbidding for people. And, it, and it's funny because the, the research that we have done around culture night shows us that 49% of people say, I want to do something new. That's why I engage with culture night. Um, but, but I do think, you know, that the openness, one of my favourite words that was used during the pandemic was porous. I have a, a real strong feeling that society is now more porous because obviously we all had to deal with something in a collaborative way like we never had before and we adapted in ways that shock and surprise us and so on. So I think there is a feeling between disciplines that, yes, of course I can think more about science now because it is more relatable to me or I can think about the arts because I listened to you know, to music on the radio much more than I did. So I think that the, there's a really good foundation for us now to build from. Oh, that's a great description. And I knew I could just let you guys go and just keep, keep talking. <laughs> Actually, as I listen to you there, I wonder, you know, we've just finished Science Week. Do we need to rebrand it Fun Week? <laughs> <laughs> Is that where we're going? But maybe uh, just I'll stay with you, Maureen, for a second. So how do we do better at this? So we just talked about the public care and the researchers care. Right? So how do we break down those barriers between? And are the barriers between the public and the researchers are there barriers between the, you know, us and maybe and government, between researchers and government? I mean, where would you see the barriers and how would you break them down? Because you've been quite successful doing that in the arts. 
Yeah, I mean, we're, we're in a good uh, situation in that coming into the pandemic in 2019, our funding was 75 million and it's now at 130 million, which is terrific. And I think that's a, we have a very good minister, Catherine Martin, at the moment, we have a very good uh, department of arts, culture, and the many other things they cover. Um, but there, I think certainly COVID helped us to relate to the public far better because um, it was that thing of people missing it and saying, oh my gosh, I'm actually surrounded by all this beautiful stuff of whatever sort, and I need to value it. And I need to be aware that artists have very, very fragile careers indeed, and that you know it's uh, particularly symptomatic of lots of freelance practitioners, both artists and, actually, and people who support them as well. So that this needs to be tended, this needs to be really, really minded. And lots of that is to do with communication, about us communicating far more clearly and passionately with the public and with government and with all the various stakeholders to say, you know, it's about poems, songs, you know, it's not about something lofty like the arts. And taking up Ijoma's point about equality, diversity and inclusion, it is not the domain just of the middle class uh, educated. We have to, it's one of the big concerns for us in the Arts Council, this, this has to be far more representative of Irish life as it's lived right now, because it's, it certainly isn't now. And once we start connecting far, with far wider cohorts of people, you know, they're making the argument for us. So really, it's about connection and communication, I would think. OK, something for us to take away there. Now, Jomi, is it the same challenge in the UK? I mean, it is in that we, well, in the UK, we have a, a very unique problem in that the arts are under threat. And the government has decided that um, it really wants to fund courses and research that lead to you know, high paying jobs in the city of London, even though we have lost our, our, our sort of dominance as, as a financial centre. Uh, just a few years after Brexit, which nobody, of course, could have predicted. This came as a complete shock. So there is now a move to try and see whether they can fund more STEM courses. And, and it's, it's actually quite unfortunate, really, because the argument around how, as you've described, the arts enrich our lives, that argument seems not, seems not to fall on, on the right ears. And, and it, it actually is creating a problem for universities trying to keep these very highly, um, I would say, high-performing world-leading centres open in, 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 the, in the face of, of this, this possible funding crisis. We, when it comes to the science subjects, I, I think that, you know, if you don't say anything when things are happening to the arts, they'll then come, a, come to your course, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually, we'll find that actually, if you're not working in a vocational subject, forget it and we'll all be the poorer for it. So there is a lot of lobbying going on, and there is also a lot of trying to make sure that these courses are relevant to a broad spectrum of people, and not just relevant to um, you know, people that have trust funds who can then go and do a course in English literature because they're not gonna be paid very well. I speak with lots of pain because my youngest daughter did a degree in English literature, and she starts out at a salary that is half of what her sisters did, her sisters did law, they did economics. Surprise, surprise, as a, you know, I regard myself almost as an immigrant. I was born in the UK, but I haven't shaken off that immigrant mentality. I wanted my children to do these vocational courses. But I know that my youngest daughter doing English literature, walking into a career which she absolutely loves, but knowing that the pay is not gonna be so good. So we really need to communicate the richness that the arts brings to our lives. And you've, you've illustrated it wonderfully, Maureen, by saying, this is what we missed. We definitely missed it. And we all rushed out to the theatres the moment we could. We have to communicate that quite clearly. It is about our mental well-being. You cannot perform in these high-performing industries if you don't have good mental well-being. So it's a lot more to do with our economic output than people actually understand as well as just making life fun. I don't wanna have a, a life that I'm just working 24 seven. Oh, oops, I do have that <laughs> life. But um, I also wanna have fun sometimes. I wanna watch Strictly Come Dancing and I, I want to watch Bake Off and I want to go and watch uh, The Lion King at the cinema, and it, sorry, at the theater. And it's very expensive by the way, it costs hundred pounds a ticket. 
Right, so we've learned a lot about uh, your TV viewing <laughs> habits there as well. Um, so we now know. But uh, okay, so Niall, then tell us, you know, what is the public interested in, in in more detail? And actually, one of the questions that we gave you time to think about as well is, what's the wackiest of the ideas that you, you've seen out of the? I think Ajoma brought that up. So you can well, yeah, it. and actually, just the slide that just disappeared off, you'll notice that one of the thematic areas: humanities, arts, and culture. Uh, so one of the the, the the public are concerned about. Uh, and have views on things that you might expect. Uh, so the climate, of course, comes into it. Health comes into it in a big way, particularly cancer and, and actually human-centred health. So it's actually as much about the way that we deal with patients as, as the actual uh, sort of clinical interventions themselves. So there, there's a, there was a, uh, that's kind of, I think, probably surprised a lot of us. Um, there's a whole area around energy efficiency and water conservation. You think in Ireland, nobody's going to talk about water conservation, but that comes through as, as a resource which needs to be protected as the population grows. There was a whole suite around the, the interface uh, around community and, and the loss or potential loss of community. So you have this phrase, mehel, which is a sense of belonging to a place. So a community isn't just a collection of houses, and this came through very much that technology and the move towards the type of things we've been discussing will isolate us, they'll make us all very, be part of smart cities, but those cities will be devoid of a soul. And actually it was really interesting, I, I, I was at a, a separate presentation a couple of years ago in Shanghai where there were three different views of what a smart city was. Cork, I was presenting, there was one from Seoul, and there was one from Copenhagen. So Copenhagen was all about the, the, the person and where they happier, that they live longer. Soul was all about the technology, and did you have the latest smartphone? And Cork was about being the real capital. So, um, <laughs> um, waiting for that one. I'd get some kudos in some places for that. Um, so, uh, but, 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 so people looked on, on that sort of sense of, of community and, and the loss of it, and that sort of just transition. And, and an example, before coming to the wackiest one, was again, that people who were, who were more elderly, but who were connected by broadband. So actually, lots more people have, have some connectivity to broadband. We're not all completely devoid of broadband. So that, in principle, allowed them to talk to their kids or talk to their neighbours or so on. But what came through in the Creating Our Future was, well, but they don't visit us anymore. So we're more connected, but simultaneously more isolated. So these can be the unintentional, but now known consequences of, of racing towards technology, which is efficient and potentially is also solves one particular problem, which is a pandemic. But thankfully, we don't live in a pandemic all the time. So we need a rebalancing of that. And that was one of the things that, that came, came through very much was, it, you know, to, to society is complex, technology, in a way, in the way it interfaces with society, needs to be better considered. That's why we were very clear to put in arts, humanities, and culture, uh, because th that comes through not in the not in the bulk number of submissions, but in the importance of those submissions. And what uh, what we would say on the team is, if you're looking at the grand challenges going forward, for example, look, look at each of those. Look at the ideas that the public have have uh, uh, um, uh, that we brought together from the public. And and for, just for those who haven't read any of the, of the document, there's two parts to it. One is purely the public voice, as, as best as we can capture it. And then there's an expert voice, expert voice, just because we happen to be called the expert committee. I always had trouble with that, that sort of moniker. But nevertheless, so you can look at the, this expert voice and you can look at the public voice and make up your own decision. But what I would suggest is also, while you're here or elsewise, there's three screens here, I've been told I have to say this, and I'm very happy to do <laughs> well so, uh, where you can, where you can uh, interrogate all 18,062 submissions, but you can also do that anyway offline. And so you can come and you can reparse ideas, get ideas from that. Uh, my view is that we should be using ideas from the Creating Our Future as part of the, the National Grand Challenges. I, I, to me, if, if it's not referenced somewhere in one of those, I think, I think it's a missed step. I'm not on the review panel, so I can, I can say that. But I think that, that richness is in there. In terms of the wackiest, and, I, and we were sort of discussing that at, at, over the lunch, um, the, the, I, I, the one that for me stands out, and it, it's captured actually, it's not on one of the slides here, but it's a department of the future. And I just like that idea that, you know, we just need a department of the future. It's that one that understands where we're all going and somehow magically brings it all together. Incidentally, that's all that was there. There wasn't an essay around the Department of the Future. It was just those th four words, Department of the Future. But I really like that because I, for, for us on the, on, on, on the committee, we felt that that kind of captured a lot 
of what was really said, that somebody somewhere also needs to grab a hold of this and bring us into this future that we're all sort of talking about in the document. Mm. It's brilliant for me to hear uh, how prominent the arts and humanities was in your research. Like we don't do an awful lot of research, but uh, what we do, we work with, 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 uh, with behaviour and attitudes every year. So the most recent wave of research we did showed that 61% of people said that the arts were essential for their mental health. So I guess it's building on all that, all that good stuff to continue making the case. It's really, really the important. question is, if we asked, and Niall maybe got some sense of it, would 61% of people recognise the years of sort of fundamental basic stuff that has to happen? You know, so if you were asked that same question in our community, with a sort of a, and for the public, you know, to say, you know, do you recognise you know, the importance of doing that sort of curiosity-driven 20 years of research before you get something you can use, like a vaccine or whatever else, would we get a 61% response rate? My impression from, from, from the documentation is that the public can understand that. Okay. Uh, I think that they'd be prepared. The concern <coughs> is this, if you have cancer, you don't want to wait 10 years for a solution to come. So of course, by definition, if you're, or if you've, if you've no housing, you want it now. But I think there's a, there's a, a longer term understanding that if we can make demonstrable progress, that, that, that as long as that progress is, is demonstrable, um, that, that it can be funded. I, I think we need to build a narrative, a slightly change the narrative as well between, in my view, between sort of fundamental and applied research. I think some research you look on at sort of, you know, let's say long time scale, because any research, anything that encourages you to ask questions and to hone that ability, it's, it's, it, it really is, there is an analogy in the arts. It's not wasted inquiry. It's not wasted brain power. We need to get around the idea that if there isn't the right answer at the end of it, that, 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 that there's an issue there. So, but there's a long time scale and there's a shorter time scale. We certainly, I certainly got the impression and in, in conversation with my colleagues that the public were willing to go with a longer time scale because they have children and grandchildren. And I think a thing that they were very clear on, we don't want this still to be there for our grandchildren. It may be too late for us, but let's not have it too late for our grandchildren. Mm. So I, I, think, I, think they, I think they're more resilient. The Irish public is, might be more resilient than we might give them uh, credit for. Mm. I think it's, it's very clear in sort of any, any interaction that I've had where I've done public communication of science that people do understand that these things take time and it doesn't cause them frustration. They, they believe that the scientific method allows for you to work for de decades. And I think when it comes to selling um, fundamental research, I think we can look at the past. We can look at research where people are just trying to understand what's happening here, what is the basis of whatever's going on in this particular area. And then the things that have come out of it, if you think about, I mean, we always think about the moon landings, whether you believe they happened or not, they did, sp they did create a lot of new technology, which we are using today. And I think being able to link the past with our current future allows you to say, I'm studying these things. I have no idea wh where it's going to take me, but we need to have this knowledge because once we have this knowledge, then we can exploit it. So I'm a governor of the Welcome and we, we put a lot of money into the Human Genome Project. And it was all about, oh, this is really gonna change our lives and oh, that kind of thing. And then it happened and nothing happened for a long time. But if we didn't actually invest in that, the whole genomics associated with tracing the virus would have been much more difficult. So we really have to be able to tell the story that previously, when we've just said, let me just look and see, it has created all this new technology and all this new service and an improved quality of life. And we should never, ever stop looking because there are still a lot of problems that we haven't solved, not just health problems, but technology problems, the way we live together, the problem of inequality hasn't been solved. And this problem is huge. Inequality blights all our lives. We should be, we should be studying just fundamentally what is it that allows us to live comfortably with inequality when we know it's harming us. So I, I, I do believe that we, we have to be able to, to sell the future better from what we are studying at the present. Okay, but so it, it, I was going to bring it, you in on more, that morning. Exactly, it, how do we do that? It is very much about continuing to ask the questions because you know we have to blow ourselves 
open even more widely because it's exactly as you say, how can we be happy to, to be in a society that is obviously so unequal? You know, so it's, it's the posing of those questions and the looking for the answers that's going to help us reach some sort of understanding. Yeah, at the, at the moment in the UK, we're going back to Dickensian times in that you've got oligarchs hiding their money in London and you've got people in the north of our country unable to eat three meals a day, relying on food banks. And I mean, I speak from someone who has been on benefits. When I was a single parent looking after my children doing a PhD, I relied on benefits to pay my rent. I never, ever had to go to a food bank. I could afford to feed my children. But now you've got working families where you've got two adults working and they still cannot afford to buy fresh vegetables. And I believe that we have this problem because the right people are not asking the research questions. And it makes, it makes us all uncomfortable. So I'm not gonna go out with all my bling, walking around, I don't know, Wolverhampton, because I'm gonna be scared that maybe I'm gonna be robbed because now I'm middle class, I'm not on benefits. It makes everybody uncomfortable. Yeah. And I'm just gonna instant, in the creating our future, the, sort of suggested solutions were not all tech solutions. So a lot of them came from the social sciences, the interface, you know, the behavioral side of things rather than the technology side of things, because people, it was about a better future. And I, and I think for the average citizen who isn't directly involved, uh, by that I mean who isn't directly involved in the research process in an, in, in an intimate way, it, it's about the quality of their life, you know, their, their, their longevity, their happiness, you know, mental health and well-being, and that of, of, their, of their children. Um, so uh, if, if, you, if you look at the way the Irish people are saying this, it's not about we need another widget and so on. It's not to say that they can't help, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much more nuanced, and it goes back to some of the earlier comments about, you know, the... It, the, the, any, any nation of, of X number of million people is going to have a lot of smart things to say. And to ignore that, or not to ignore it intentionally, to maybe, because of busyness or whatever it might be, but that we don't take enough heed of it, it would be a mistake. We're lucky that we have this, this report, this, this 18,000 people mm -hmm. who've, who've, who've bothered to put something in, you know, into the public domain. And, and it's, it's free and it's open. And I think that's a, a, a credit from an Irish perspective to, to sort of the population as a whole. So, but just it's, you know, our future isn't, isn't only around technology. But just on one thing, going back to the, the step change, I mean, the quantum type mechanics that James was talking about earlier, you know, as we crack those fundamental laws, of course it opens doors, mm -hmm. which be, can be transformative. The question is, how do we use that to transform our society in a controlled way that we, in, in as much as you can control, that, that we're all as happy as we can be with? And that's part of what creating our future was asking. We need to be happy with it so we don't, we don't in any way disconnect from being, you know, we're being, we just to be. And, and that's really important as well. Okay, so the, the public buys into it. Right. We are preaching to the choir a little bit here, so Maureen, what can we <laughs> learn from you in terms of how successful you've been at explaining the value and how can we be better at doing that? What's the kind of call to action you would recommend here? Well, I'm so excited the, uh, that somebody has come forward with the Department of the Future. Like, I can't wait to tell my colleagues in the arts about this because that's the sort of thing they, they will seize upon and, and, and jump on. That came um, from us first, that's copyright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and just as a, I guess as a, a signal maybe, and I mean, I'm constantly surprised by this, the, the government has brought in a basic income, a pilot scheme for artists, whereby 2,000 artists um, have been selected from a cohort of 9,000 applicants to receive a basic income for the next three years, which is a brilliant thing. I mean, it's transformative. But what's, constant, what's surprising to me is that there seems to me to have been very little pushback from other sectors, which signals an acceptance of the arts and wider society. And hopefully this will be successful and it will be able to, to be more universally availed of and, uh, and introduced. So I, I guess it's, it's the impact thing that, you know, knowing better how we can communicate with government and with the public about what the arts actually does for them. And that's about speaking more frequently and more plainly and more beautifully to, to the people who matter, I think. 
Okay, that's a, a big ask. Okay, Joma, would you have what advice would you have for any scientists here today, and how we can really have that impact? I, I think that you should talk to someone who hasn't got technical knowledge about what you do. When I'm ever doing an oral exam for a PhD student, my first question is, imagine I'm your grandmother. You haven't visited me in four years. What have you been doing? I hope it's been worthwhile. <laughs> I want to know what you've discovered. And they start, oh, it's this experiment and that experiment. I don't understand that. What did you discover? About four or five questions in, they finally managed to get a few sentences out that make sense. Mm -hmm. So I think we should practice speaking to people who are not in our disciplines and who are lay persons and telling them what we do. But I think also just moving to a more strategic level. If you're in charge of broadcasting or you've got a podcast, make sure you have a multiple of voices coming on as experts. Make sure you always don't go to the same people. Go to people who are early career researchers. Go to people from different racial groups. Have a few women, God forbid, on your, as experts on, on, in your podcast or your program so that members of the public can see that this expertise and this excellence comes from many different areas and they can begin to relate to it. And it's not that far away. And they will go back and tell their children or as children, they will aspire to be like some of these experts. So we can have, I know we have a really highly developed workforce in Ireland, very highly educated, very, very much participation. But you can always do with a few more from the lower socioeconomic groups. Now we have a couple of questions coming in from Slido, some great ones, not a lot of time, so we're going to go and hammer through a few, oh they disappeared on me. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, if we can get the questions back, that's great. But I actually remember the first one I saw on the list anyway, which I have to see who wants to take this one. But should, so the communications, science communications is an art in itself, is the way the question came. Should this be taught at undergraduate level as a course to all? My answer is yes, Absolutely. resoundingly yes. Yeah. And I think it's a good idea to partner a scientist with an artist who can communicate, as we saw that beautiful communication about geology on the screen. Okay, so a takeaway we should be doing. Absolutely, and I think partly because it's not trivial. So as soon as we st you think that it's easy, then you don't do the course. It's not. So that's why, we, that's why we need to encourage people to do that. It's a skill. Yeah, okay. And maybe if we have a whole army of good communicators coming through, it'll really help. The COVID pandemic illustrated the damage of misinformation in science. So any suggestions from the panel on communication strategies to ensure the message is not misinterpreted or to prevent the circulation of misinformation? Well, I think one of the things COVID showed us actually was that um, if you take certain mitigations uh, that are suggested by the scientists, I'm going to call it just the scientists because we're running out of time, then you can see that there are trends there in, in terms of dealing with that. I think in a sense that that trumps the misinformation in terms of, you know, uh, uh, well, it, it, it trumps the misinformation. There's probably more to say on that. But I think it, it, the pandemic was useful from that perspective, that we actually have managed to get something of a hold of it. Uh, and so I think that that's, that's been very important. Certainly the response, we get a black rock as people come in and say, you know, they'd all speak positively of this time and scientists as actually doing something useful. Okay, now I'm conscious we've gone into negative time, which unless somebody in Seamus Davis's quantum field can get, do something about that, um, I'm going to have to wrap up. So one last thought from anybody, so like as a call to action that you'd like to take away from here as a, as a group, what should it be? If, uh, Talk so about your work to different people. Make sure we, we get people together. Artists absolutely love working with, with scientists, I would say, with engineers, with people from all sorts of disciplines. Yeah, and Carl Sagan has mentioned there, so I'm going to quote, we are the universe becoming conscious of itself. I think we just need to work together to be as conscious about the universe in all its forms, art, science, everything, and, and enjoy the fact that we're privileged to live, actually. Okay, well, that's a lovely way to end it. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to our panel. <laughs> <laughs>